Conservation Ag Update is brought to you by BioTill Cover Crops. Welcome to the show. Great to have you with us as always. I'm Noah Newman. Hey, we've got some new economic data from the Precision Conservation Management Program in Illinois. So they're comparing all the field passes in no-till, strip-till, and multi-pass systems to see which one gives farmers the most bang for their buck. Right now, no-till is actually leading the pack on cornfields with high soil productivity ratings. No-till here in that full data set, it actually makes up a little less than 20% of all of the high SPR corn uh, acres in that data set, but we see it being used more and more in recent years, in 2022, 2023, uh, and 2024, and it has performed really well in those years. And since we think that 2025 and 2026 are likely to be more similar in terms of price and input costs, we would say that no-till was more profitable than expected in four out of 10 years. And this is really notable. And especially since three of the most recent years are years that no-till performed quite well. And of course, higher machinery costs over the last three years are factoring into that equation. And the data also shows that strip-till performed the best in fields with low soil productivity ratings. All right, well, back in August, we might remember we covered a historic storm that dumped a foot of rain in the Milwaukee area in like less than a day. It was crazy. Bossy's Farms in Colgate, Wisconsin was right in the middle of it as we check out some footage showing the aftermath of all that rain. But fast forward to October and their pumpkins turned out great. Blake Bossy credits his switch to strip till and cover crops for helping the pumpkins survive and thrive. The rain event of that magnitude in the past, we would have seen at least a 50, 60, even 70% loss in our fields. Um, we were shocked and during the flooding event, we were quite worried because we knew what happened in the past, but we came out here after those historic rains, we had a foot of rain in a two day window. And if it wasn't for all of our pumpkins sitting on rye and strip tilling and getting them off to such a great start to sit on the rye and stay on the rye and disease pressures down, uh, we would have had a much different outcome if it wasn't for strip tilling, using that cover crop rye. Uh, I, I mean, that's the only thing I can chalk it up to because those are these are the big differences we just made. And, and they just switched to that system in 2024 after several years of conventional tillage. Blake will drill in a heavy rate of cereal rye after soybean harvest, and then he'll make strips through that rye in the spring before planting pumpkins. So Ross Bishop, who farms about 13 miles down the road from Blake, also dealt with all that flooding and whenever it rains, Bishop's no-till fields usually hold up better than his neighbor's conventional fields, and he has the visual evidence to prove it. By doing no-till, you can see the difference there. And this was on a Sunday, I was going to church, and the neighbor had planted winter wheat that, that fall. This was in April when this three-inch rain happened. And you can see all the brown coming off his field. And I had corn stubble, no-till, and the water was coming off clear. So it looks a whole lot better. And I've had people say, well, you know, you got nutrients still coming off. I understand that. It's not a perfect world yet, but I think the good Lord wants us to be good stewards and we're doing our best. This is what we got now. Good stuff as always from Ross. That was from a recent Cedar Creek Farmers Field Day. And let's send it over to Associate Editor McCain Vogel now for today's Cover Crop Connection. McCain, what you got? Thanks, Noah. McCain Vogel here with this week's Cover Crop Connection. Well, no-till innovator and Williamsport, Indiana no-tiller Rick Clark knows just how important it is to manage your cover crops as if they were your cash crops. Let's take a listen to Clark's advice about the nutrient sequestration powers of cereal rye and the positive and negative impact it could have on weeds and corn. So now, if you want to plant corn into cereal rye, you need to move your nitrogen program further forward to offset what the cereal rye has sequestered nutrient-wise. So now the same thing is happening with the weeds. We're, we're, we're buckling the weeds at their knees. The broad leaves are pretty much gone. But now what's happening is, now we're to my 70-30 rule. So that cereal rye has suppressed those weeds for 70% of what it needs to be done. If you haven't reached canopy though, now that cereal rye is releasing those nutrients back out, guess what? Just in time for when grass comes on. Mm -hmm. Foxtail is a late emerging weed in the season. We are now dumping all 
of those nutrients for the foxtail. And here it comes. And it comes. If you don't have that good suppression of the of the of the biomass from the cover crop and in cash crop canopy, you're going to have foxtail. And we've got foxtail in certain fields. And I can always attribute it back to what I'm just describing. Well, some wise words, as always, from no-till innovator Rick Clark. Well, that's it for this week's Cover Crop Connection. Until next time, I'm McCain Vogel. Back to you, Noah. Good stuff as always. Thank you very much, McCain. Well, with harvest season in full swing, we asked our audience, given the low corn prices, are you leaving corn in the field longer to dry so your drying costs aren't as high? And if so, are you going to plant cover crops later or just skip them all together? Let's check out a couple of responses. Robert Rabideau says his cover crop was planted with a drone over cash crops in early September. And yes, he is waiting for corn to dry down. It's not uncommon for him to run into November with corn harvest. Meanwhile, in Clayton, Michigan, Blaine Baker has already planted his cover crops with a high boy in late August. And he says he just started harvesting corn. Things can get bad fast if you wait any longer and good drying days are far and few. Well, let us know what you think. You can join the email discussion group at notillfarmer.com. Moving on, we had boots on the ground at the World Dairy Expo earlier this month in Madison, Wisconsin. And there was a lot of buzz from people there that 2026 is going to be a bounce back year for ag. But Steve Peshek from Zimmerman Manufacturing says, uh, let's just wait a minute and see. There is a lot of crop in storage that needs to go somewhere before we can get through this glut. And, and I think also, Again, what are the yields going to be from this year, and you know, and then how is that going to going to affect things? So, um, you know, we hope that we hope that uh, things improve and that that incomes improve. But you know, one of the things that we do is is we make equipment to make you more efficient. We on the manure side, we get the nitrogen in the ground where it doesn't all get evaporated into the air. On the tillage side, or strip till can certainly reduce your input costs. To if if you aren't going to get more for your for your product that you're producing, you have to find a way to reduce the, the, the amount that it's going to cost you to grow this crop. Wrapping things up with our video of the week. This one comes to us from Technology Days in Atlanta, Indiana. During a root reveal, Beck's agronomist revealed some key insights about the impact higher plant populations have on roots. Check it out. For every 1,000 plants, we increase planting population. Individual root size decreases two and a half percent. Now, what have we been doing to our planting populations for the last 20 years? About 400 plants per year. So if that's true, what that means, if you do the math, that means 1% per year individual plant root size has been decreasing in the last 20 years. And 20% smaller roots. Well, how might that impact in fertility placement? or population management. We redid that research in 2024 at the University of Illinois. Our data mimicked Dr. Barnhart's data exactly. For every 1,000 plants, we increased plant population. Individual root size decreased two and a half percent. So that may help us make other decisions as well. And that'll do it for this week's episode. Shoot me an email in Newman at lessermedia.com if you have any story ideas. Hope harvest season is going great. We'll see you next time on Conservation Ag Update. Thanks for tuning in.